The world around us is filled with important, unanswered questions. Questions that can be answered with math, from deciding the most effective recycling plan for a city, to predicting the spread of disease, and figuring out what makes a school lunch taste good. But how does math do all of that? I've been involved for a few years now with Moody's Math Challenge, and it seems that every year, you know, we're always excited to see all these results from the different teams, but we also get feedback from the teams, and many of them, they say, oh, this is a great problem. You know, we had a really great time getting involved in the problem and trying to figure it out, but we wish we would have known more about this modeling process um, beforehand. And we don't have a class like that at school. It's, it's a really rare thing to have in a, in a high school setting. Some schools do have it, but not many. So we really thought there's a need for this. We're, we're hearing from the students there's a need to develop some sort of guidebook or handbook to help students get into the process quickly. To meet that need, the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics created Math Modeling, Getting Started and Getting Solutions, a free handbook that provides a basic process for building mathematical models. We like to view the modeling process not as a sequence of specific steps, but there are different components that are revisited multiple times. And they include coming up with a concise problem statement, uh, making some assumptions about the problem that you're trying to understand, identifying the key variables in the problem so that you've got input and output to your model and what you want to measure at the end of the day, and then solving the model and analyzing your results. The first step in developing a model is defining the problem being solved. Figure out what question is being asked. So, and, and I know that that sounds simple, but a lot of times when you say, oh, I want the best way to do something. Well, tell me what you mean by best. Do you mean the one that's the cheapest way to get it done? Do you mean the one that's the fastest way to get it done? What question are you really asking? Once the question is defined, assumptions need to be made in order to begin building the model. For example, when modeling the spread of a disease, you might assume that the disease spreads at a constant rate versus some variable rate. When trying to find the ideal recycling method for a city, you might assume that only a certain percentage of people will participate in drop-off recycling. Sometimes these assumptions can be made based on prior studies or available data, and sometimes they are simply reasonable assumptions in the absence of data. Next is determining which inputs, quantifiable numbers and data, can actually be measured, and how does the output of your model depend on those variables. Once I've decided what it is I'm trying to do, what sorts of things are my inputs and what sorts of things are my outputs, and I'm, I'm sort of the process of, okay, now that I know what I'm trying to get at, how do I quantify that? How do I get my hands on those quantities that I have control of, those inputs, and how are they going to affect the outputs? Once the question, assumptions, and variables are in place, the next step is to build a solution using the mathematical skills and tools at your disposal. So you do some research and then you're putting together more assumptions and actually getting down to equations. I think this variable is related to this variable by this sort of equation. So once you get your model together, you have now a set of equations, a set of inputs, a set of outputs. Then you've got to figure out how to solve the equations. And again, this varies based on what your skill set is. So if you're someone who you know does calculations by hand and with a calculator, that's great. So you'll do cal you know calculations by hand, and maybe some of them you have to do some estimation. Totally fine. Um, if you're someone who has more sophisticated tools then you can perhaps take advantage of some software. So Excel, or you can use some of the open source programming languages. Um, a lot of them are to totally appropriate to solve differential equations or anything like that. A critical step in the modeling process is a systematic evaluation of the output that the model generates. One of the aspects that we really try to highlight in the handbook is that math modeling certainly does not lead you to one answer and one answer alone. There's a big difference between getting an answer and the answer at the end of the day because when you're solving a math modeling question, it's open-ended. So the answer at the end of the day that a student might get depends on the assumptions that they made at the beginning. So different groups of students would come at it from a different approach. And a good example of that is a disease modeling problem. Um, so if you were asked to predict how quickly does a disease spread, there's a lot of things that come into play with that and one student may have a very simple model. You know, one person has it, gives it to two people every day, those two people give it to two more people. That's an answer to that problem that ignores a lot of 
um, realistic components to disease spreading, but it's still an answer. In defining the math modeling process, we're really saying that here's this thing that you're going to encounter. It's not a set of steps in which you're saying, oh, I've done step one, I've, done, I've gone to step six, and now I'm done with my model forever. Um, in many cases, when you're dealing with uh, real world problem solving, you are expecting to encounter a variety of solutions. And in fact, I would argue that if you, if you only have one solution, your answer is less believable. And one thing I emphasize throughout math modeling, saying that you want to find an answer. Well, once you find the answer, you want to analyze the answer. You want to communicate the answer. And, and then, probably through that analysis process and talking about it with others, you're going to realize, wait, there's other ways to do this. Or there are, way, there are ways that, there are things we made assumptions um, about that we realized we could change those things. And now we'd have a stronger model if we, if we, uh, Went back to the. We went back to this other part of our model. Made these, you know, made a switch here, made a switch there, and now we have a different solution. Or maybe we find out that it's the same solution. So we have a really strong solution. So you're going to continue to move throughout this process. I would say you'd cycle through it, and that'd probably be a, a way that I would describe the process as opposed to the steps that are incorporated into modeling. Another vital step in model assessment is to analyze how changes in the assumptions and parameters affect the model's output. For example, in a model used to predict the cost of a school lunch, does a minor change in one input, say the cost of fruit, have a small or large impact on the model's output? So I know that we need to have, you know, this much fruit and this much vegetable and this much whatever, and I've assumed that fruits cost this much. And we have to make assumptions in order to get an output for our model, but I don't, I don't really know that that's how much fruits cost all the time, year round. So if I play with that number a little bit, if I make it a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, does that make the change in the total cost of lunch a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller? Or does changing that fruit cost make the, the, you know, the answer totally wildly different? There's an important step at the end of the modeling process that comes with analyzing your results. And it, there's a great deal of honesty in that in terms of linking your solution to the assumptions that you made and being able to back it up with realistic data. And there's a process called validating your model where you would like to take your model and perhaps use it to solve a problem that the solution is known to show that you're able to, to get that answer. Finally, the ability to write a solution paper and communicate your findings is as important as the solution itself. I hate to generalize, but I would say that many people would say math is just too difficult to understand. Right? How am I going to figure out anything based on this formula? So um, you can do all the math that you want, you can solve all the problems you want to, but if no one knows what you're talking about, then it's not going to be of any use to anyone. The ability to communicate your answers to the general public is of utmost importance because otherwise your solution will not be able to impact the uh, real world problem or the activities that you'd like it to impact. One of the handbook's takeaways is that math modeling doesn't require having advanced mathematical knowledge. Models can be created using even basic math concepts. You don't need to have some super high-powered tools in order to develop solutions to these things. You can create good models using the tools for mathematics that you know. And that's really the kind of thing I like to convey to the public and saying that you, you do math modeling. You engage in it on a regular basis, even though you may not be aware of it. And understanding more mathematics just gives you a, a larger toolbox 